Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks! Hi, I'm Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, Exit Interviews with the Living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week, coming live from Richmond, Virginia, is Megan Janik. She's a public relations specialist, and uh, we're going to learn a lot about the supernatural and her opinions on mortality and how it affects life and everything else that we usually get into. But uh, I'm really excited for this one because we have some really interesting topics to go over. So without any further ado, Megan, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about this. Yeah, and I know I got you hot off of a fun weekend, so I'm going to tease that right now. But before we get to that, I'd like to ask you my standard three questions, which is um, how old are you, where did you grow up, and what generation do you consider yourself uh, from? Yeah, sounds good. By the way, I've been listening to a bunch of your other episodes before now. Big fan of the show, I will say, um, as well as the fact that we are uh, also friends offline. So this is just really exciting to be part of this. But I am 38, uh, just turned it recently. And um, I actually consider myself a early millennial, but being a baby of 83, you kind of fit into that world where you grew up without necessarily the technology of the day, but it also defined my uh, you know, primary years of the internet coming into being and everything. Um, and as for where I grew up, I always say all over. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, but I have lived in Florida, New York, Indiana, Virginia, California. So um, I don't really identify with one particular place as to where I grew up. Wow, that's cool. And as you said, we are friends, but I had no idea you'd lived in that many places. That's really cool. And it's funny because you have a slight like accent, but it's so slight. So it's interesting to hear like how that all came about. And I guess it's probably because you first learned English in Atlanta or were you already out of there? Oh, no, we moved um, from there when I was about a year and a half down to Florida. Uh, so people always say they can't exactly pinpoint what my accent is, and I have no idea. <laughs> that's exactly what I was kind of getting at. Is like there's something there, but I don't know where. Um, that's cool. So um, you're very open-minded, and that's my favorite quality in anyone. So when we've talked about like any subject, you're just kind of like interested, and you're a seeker. I, I would definitely say that about you. So what would you say? Uh, led you to being so open-minded about all things like spiritual? Was it your upbringing, your parents? Was it just personal? Yeah, I mean, growing up, I wasn't, my parents weren't particularly religious. My father uh, grew up Presbyterian, but we went to church some in my early years, but I would say by middle school, we had stopped going to church. My mom, uh, she actually met my father through a youth group, but by the time I came along, she was pretty much out of organized religion. So she almost never attended with us and definitely never forced it. So that kind of left a gap in me figuring out what else there is. And of course, you know, I think being a baby of the 80s and the 90s and then the early 2000s when the show Ghost Hunters was so popular, um, there's just, uh, I think ghost stories are very interesting, have always been very interesting to me. So I think that leads itself to questioning what comes next and kind of started to inform my own internal yeah I do call it faith or spirituality I guess I call it more than faith um but yeah I would say a lot of pop culture had a had a presence for me <laughs> that's very cool that's a really good answer very articulate and a lot of questions for me to ask and so I guess the first one I would want to know is currently right now today um what is it like Sunday, July 25th. Do you um, believe in life after death? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Awesome. And how would you explain not only your belief, but then also the confidence that you have in that? I would like to hear both, if that makes sense. Oh, man, let me crack my knuckles here. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I was thinking about this, obviously, before we had our call. And I feel like I'm on a quest uh, to discover, you know, paranormal, uh, life after death at the moment. Um, it's been kind of growing for years, but particularly, uh, when the pandemic set in last year and I had a lot of free time, I started watching a ton of ghost shows and that really sent me down the rabbit hole. However, 
um, I don't believe I'm ever going to find any solid answers. What I do believe, though, is there's some continuity of our soul after we die. Um, some of the different shows I've even, or just different people I've listened to and heard from recently, I kind of have this thought that when you die, your soul has a choice to either remain on this plane, maybe uh, you have some things you still need to sort out, or you just aren't ready to to leave or whatever, or you can move on, as they say. But I also believe the spirits that move on can come back and visit us, as in our loved ones checking in on us, or um, I don't know, there's some, there's some way that they... <sighs> Heaven isn't a place that you just go to and disappear to and never have any interaction with earth anymore. And and I don't also think of heaven as like a space in the clouds and white light and all that. I just, uh, I actually heard a, a term recently that heaven is a state of mind more than um, a physical place or a spiritual place after death. Um, I was trying to talk to my husband before we started recording to think through my thoughts on this. And I realized when I start getting into it, my brain goes a million different directions, which I guess you've also discovered by doing this show that there's no linear path to discussing life after death. Literally nothing. Yes, I more than agree. Um, actually, let me just ask you a direct question based on like what you were saying, which is... Um, so I know that you lost your father like somewhat recently and that's something that we actually became like friends kind of talking about um, because I think loss is the hardest thing in the world and I think that you have to open up and talk about it. And so that's why I felt okay bringing this up on the podcast. So do you like communicate with your father? Do you have any like thing you want to like talk about that with? Has that changed or helped you achieve this realization? I do not um, have a current relationship with him, I would say. Um, I, okay, so my father passed in 2013. Um, he passed from complications following open heart surgery. Uh, we had discovered less than a year before he passed that he had AFib and it just felt like everything happened so suddenly. And even though we had another 10 months with him, it was, it was hard to kind of wrap our brains around. So uh, I do, I, I will actually share the story of the day he passed. Um, so, he had had open heart surgery. Unfortunately, the next day we were informed that he had suffered a massive stroke and would not be recovering, uh, which is a major blow. You just don't think your parents are ever going to leave you. And um, so uh, the final day, it had come to a point where the stroke wasn't taking him naturally and we had to take him off oxygen and um, and just wait for nature to happen. And, you know, it takes about... It, well. It, takes different time, but for us, it was about four or five hours from the time that he came off the machines to when he passed. And it was hard as my brothers, my mother and I, um, all sitting around watching this happen. And at one point I remember I'm sitting at the end of the bed, looking at him and I'm, I'm crying. And I said, he's not ready to leave. He loves us. And he's just, he's not ready, but dad, you kind of have to it's like a train is coming and it's, it's your turn. You have to get on it. And, but we love you. And I kind of felt in that moment that it was coming from, I don't know where, like, I mean, of course I'm upset. I'm thinking about him passing, of course, but this, these words that came out of me just kind of felt like it was something else. So, you know, put a pin in that, um, a little time passes. I'm walking around the room and his, hospital room was on the corner of the building. There's, you know, windows on two sides and the curtains were closed and he was kind of, his head at the time was kind of faced towards the windows. And I opened the curtains because I thought something inside me was like, he needs a, a path to exit. And that was weird, but I didn't talk to anyone in the room about it. And then shortly after that, the song pops into my head of Billie Holiday's, that'll be the day. That'll be the day we say goodbye. And it's just stuck in my head. And this isn't a song that I ever think of. I've heard it probably in movies before, but it's nothing on my playlist, you know. So a little time passes. And finally, you know, one brother goes to talk to his wife. Another brother needs to make a phone call. My mom goes downstairs to the cafeteria to get a little food. I say, I'm going to stay behind uh, with dad. I'm fine. You know, all this kind of stuff. So they leave. I take out my uh, iPod or whatever it was at the time and download this song. And I put one earbud in mine and one earbud in his 
And mind you, he's been unresponsive for five days. You know, science says that he can't hear, he can't do anything. Uh, but I laid there with my head on his arm and played the song. And I just stared at the monitors at his oxygen levels. And just as the song was ending, suddenly the oxygen levels started to plummet. And I remember fumbling for my phone to contact my brothers and mother to tell them, I think he's going. If you want to come back, you need to come back. And in fumbling with that, the song ended. I looked up and he was gone. And so I don't know where that came from. And that that kind of stuck with me for a long time. It was both profound, but obviously odd. Well, so uh, recently, this is 2021 now, eight years later, I decided to uh, sit down or speak to a medium for the first time, a psychic medium. I know a lot of people, you know, don't necessarily believe in them and that's fine. I know that there's some that probably are full of it, but this one in particular, I just, I really love her personality and um, I would be friends with her in real life if I could, because she's just great. So I, I wanted to chat with her. So part of her thing is she connects with a loved one. I asked her to connect with my dad and I feel like it was fairly authentic. It was a weird experience. I don't, I don't know. I'd, I'd almost want to do it again, but it did feel a little bit like I was having a telephone conversation with my dad. It's interesting. In any, yeah. So in any case, obviously that was the biggest question on my mind. What happened that day? I had these feelings. What was that? And she basically said that he's not taking responsibility for it. He didn't do that. And she said, she's like, I picked up that you seem to be an empath. And she's like, I'm pretty sure the light workers, the helpers, the spirits on the other side were working through you to make him at peace to help transition. And she also said that my father said that, yes, I helped him be at peace with what was happening. I mean, that's, I got total goosebumps when you're telling the story. And I also like very emotional right now. I, I literally, my daughter was born like three days ago. So I'm a dad to a daughter now. So I, I just want to say that that's like beautiful. I mean, it's sad, like the, how early he left us and you know, everything you described, but the purpose of this podcast is to help people like find some sort of meaning for themselves. And so I think there's a lot in that. And um, it sounds like it, it worked for you. And as far as the medium and stuff goes, you know, we had someone on the show who was a medium. And uh, it's definitely something that the older I get, I am more interested and open minded about it. It's a little hard for me to wrap my brain around all of it. But I am curious, um, if, if heaven is a state of mind, which I actually love, I'm going to uh, remember that quote for a long time. So it's not just a space in the clouds. Do you think that like your father's mind is still like somewhere? Well, according to that meeting, um, she says that he, do he does check in on me sometimes. And okay, so one of the things at the beginning of the pandemic last year, I even mentioned to my husband, I was like, I keep feeling like I see this flash of something out of the corner of my eye. It's just weird. It just keep keeps happening. And then eventually it kind of subsided and I wasn't really thinking about it at all. And then I'm talking to her that day, only a couple months ago. And she goes, somebody, are you seeing like flashes out of the corner of your eye? And I was like, I was, that's weird that you were asking me that out of the blue. And she's like, that's your dad. He doesn't want to scare you. And he doesn't really want to like show himself or something. I don't know if he even could show himself, but that that's usually when he was checking in. And I was like, oh, okay. So now I've been trying to pay attention to it since that happened. I mean, since my conversation and I still wouldn't say it's necessarily happened again. Maybe, but it's such a vague thing. I don't, I don't necessarily feel him. Sadly, uh, you know, I met the love of my life about six months after he passed. And so therefore he wasn't there on my wedding day. And on my wedding day, I had a photo of him. I, I had as much of his presence with me as I could bring in, but I can't say I ever necessarily felt him that day. I was also very much caught up in everything else happening, but um, I, I didn't necessarily feel his presence. And then we have my mom who still misses him greatly and is still really suffering through dealing with that loss. And the medium says that he spends most of his time with her, that he's just around there and present and that it's not her time, but that he's hanging out until it is her time. And he even apparently she said something like he was talking about there's some paper she's working on. And at the time she was working through some uh, Medicare things that she was finally having to figure out. And so, yeah, I don't I don't know. Uh, it, it felt authentic. Um, 
so I, I think that just kind of goes along with my theory that you can pass on and move on after death, but you can still come back and, and be a part of your loved one's lives as to whatever extent. That resonates deeply with me. And I think, uh, first of all, I know like the definition of faith is like a total catch 22. It's like, it's to believe in something that is never going to be able to be proven, at least in this, um, plane, this reality that we're in. And so I, I do think that that's what it takes to communicate. And then we have like something in common. I, I think I mentioned to you this, but my, one of my best friends from childhood, um, passed away from liver cancer when he was like 36 and it was in, uh, 2018 and I met my wife like two months later and right before he died he said I'll help you meet your love of your life from the other side and it just like I thank him Stop. literally every day yeah no and it like it's just cool and like I don't care what anyone else thinks I don't care if it you know some atheist wants to like pin me to the <laughs> whatever but I just it feels right to me and I just feel like it works and I think your dad definitely helped you meet our mutual friend your husband so I yeah so here's a funny story when I met him, when I met my husband, Andrew, uh, we had been dating a few months and I vaguely knew where he worked. I knew he worked off this one road in an office park, but, or I think I, th I thought that, but so I was, I was laying in bed with him one night and I was like, where exactly do you work? And he describes it. And I swear to God, he's one building over from where my father's last job was. And with my father's AFib, he got to where he couldn't drive. So there were times that my whole family is splitting the responsibilities of driving him and picking him up from work. And so I went to that office park plenty before he passed. And I just, you know, Richmond's a decent sized city. It's not the biggest, it's not the smallest either. So to have them share the same building practically is odd. I mean, definitely. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's weird. Uh, I've said this so many times on this podcast, but I'm gonna repeat it. Cause it's my favorite quote. Um, someone I'm close to her name's Lynn Bunch said, it's only a coincidence if you believe in coincidences. And I just think that kind of sums it up. Like, <laughs> So, all right, I want to uh, shift gears because we are uh, we got some time left, but I do want to hear um, a little bit about like what you just did this weekend. So do you want to like let us know what that was? Yeah, sure. So um, like I said, uh, over the last uh, couple of years, my interest in the paranormal has definitely been growing. So finally this year, I'm like, you know, I should actually put these thoughts to action. And um, let's look into how I can even try to be a part of a paranormal investigation. Well, a lot of groups now, paranormal tourism is a thing. People go to haunted places, they go to haunted bed and breakfast. And now there's also groups that say, you know, hey, you want to come investigate with us? Cool, we're holding a big gathering. So this group in Virginia called Haunted Nights Paranormal Events, they did one last night at Tuckahoe Plantation in the western part of um, the greater suburbs of Richmond. Uh, this is a plantation that dates back to before the revolution, and uh, its claim to fame is that Thomas Jefferson lived there for seven years of his early childhood and probably learned to read and write in the, the schoolhouse that was on the site. Um, so I was like, sure, let's let's give this a shot. My husband and I went, you know, we paid our, I can't remember how much it was, but these events can range from like $50 to $150 per person. Um, but you know, it started at six and it went till 2 AM. We didn't get home and to bed until three 30. I'm still kind of waking up with my coffee right now, actually, as we talk. Um, and there was probably, I, don't know, I would say maybe 40 people. It, it wasn't that small, but what they did was it was such a large property. They split everyone into teams and kind of rotated through the different locations beginning around eight ish. And you then, you know, eight to two with 15 minute breaks in between hour long investigations at each area. And basically they were like, you know, we're going to make sure someone experienced is on each team. But other than that, whatever you all want to do to try to experience something or get any evidence, so to speak, um, you do it. We don't have a lot of information on this location other than that's very old. There's a couple tiny little whispers of maybe some things seen, but otherwise we want to just see what you get and see what happens. And so it was, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, one of the things I was really excited to try out last night and we did, and we actually finally got some pretty interesting evidence from it potentially is this new method of investigation called the Estes method. 
it was developed by a couple guys that were working out at the Stanley Hotel um, as like the resident paranormal investigators that would also take, you know, tourists around the hotel and such. And uh, some people may have heard of a spirit box, but a spirit box is a type of radio that was developed about 20, 30 years ago that can scan the radio frequencies quickly. So it just keeps, think that think of like your car radio when you hit it on scan, it just skips between stations until you find the one you want to get to. It's that, but sped up. And so the idea is, as it scans through the radio stations, it's not staying on any of them long enough to really hear what the people are saying, but that through this, words can sometimes come through as if like, and phrases actually, more importantly, phrases, because if a phrase comes through five words when it's already skipped through six different channels, where did that come from? How is that being strung together between six different radio channels, right? So yeah, kind of weird. So, you know, shows have been using them for the past 10 years or so, and it's really annoying on the show when it's it's sitting in the middle of the room and it's going off and it's just very loud and very awful to listen to on camera. So this new one, though, they thought, you know, when you have this thing going and you're asking questions into an empty room and you're hoping for an answer, your bias is going to set in and you're going to start trying to guess the phrase to align with what you just asked. So they're like, let's try something else. Let's try uh, sensory deprivation. We're going to put a blindfold on. We're going to put noise canceling headphones. We're going to plug that into the spirit box. One person's going to sit there and all they're going to do is listen intently and say what they hear. They can't hear anyone else in the room. So everyone else in the room is sitting there having, trying to have a conversation with any spirits that might be in the room. And that way, if what they say aligns with what the people are asking, then you might actually have something going on there because the person under the the headphones isn't biased by what the conversation is. Kind of cool, kind of cool. So, so last night I was like, okay, cool, we're gonna try this. And it was the first two locations and I was the one that went under and, and tried it. And, and there's also some thought too that the longer you listen to it, it's almost like the white noise creates this meditative state and that might also possibly help you hear things better. But anyway, um, the first few times I tried it, there wasn't really much conclusive. Aside from the very first location, uh, the other people in the room towards the end of our time there said, would you like us to leave? And I had heard, uh, yes. And I said, yes, maybe, because I frequently kept saying maybe, because I was like, I don't know, I think this is what I'm hearing, but it's really hard to kind of interpret some of this stuff. And immediately following that, I heard a very strong, yep, as in like confirming that, yes, I heard yes. And so then I got tapped and I took off my headphones and they were like, okay, it's time to leave. Like there wasn't a lot in there that really happened, but we asked, would you like us to leave now? And then you repeated yes twice. So <laughs> that was kind of weird. <laughs> um, so, you know, take that as you will. Anyway, uh, then it's around midnight and we're inside the the main building the main house and uh we actually switched it out i had my husband try it for the first time and i did all the asking of questions and things started to get weird and we moved between two rooms in the house and we believe the same spirit followed us to the two rooms and then later we were in that schoolhouse i mentioned earlier and I believe it might have been the same spirit that had continued to follow us out there and continued the conversation. So what happened was in the first room, we're not getting a whole lot of anything. And then, uh, gosh, I don't remember how it actually started. But essentially, we got this feeling that it was a soldier. Um, I tried asking how old they were. And immediately, my husband said, very old, kind of weird. Kind of weird that it was like an immediate reaction because, again, he's only listening to radio. He has no clue what I'm asking. Um, yeah. And so, but, okay, this is this is where it gets really weird. This guy that was coming through, we think is a guy, we think is maybe a, a dead soldier, possibly very, you know, whatever. He starts getting flirty. It was weird. He was saying some things as if, like, he even repeated the word sexual twice, which is like, what is happening? And can I just say, being flirted with a ghost that your husband is channeling somehow is a weird experience. <laughs> but so at the end of that first room, you know, we needed to move on to the second one. 
And uh, it seemed like it was responding intelligently and pretty, you know, on point to we would ask a question and a pretty made sense answer would come from my husband. So I said, look, if you want to continue talking, we're going to move to this other room. You can follow us there. And so we, we get to the other room. We started up. And within the first minute we hear uh, we were chatting. He also uh, shortly after that said the word said the name Greg Johnson. I don't know who that is. I don't know if that's supposed to be the person we were talking to. I don't know. Um, It didn't seem to make sense to anything else. We couldn't pinpoint when the guy died. He wouldn't tell us that information. Um, So we didn't get a whole lot of details about this person if we were connected to someone. But then uh, when we were out in the schoolhouse, again, it kind of seemed like they might have been coming through. And it also kind of started with, I love you. And I was like, what is happening here? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I don't know it was weird and then the one other thing we had happen too is uh, this thing called an EMF detector uh, K2 device so an EMF uh, measures well it's basically electronic waves coming off of things so people um, in homes will use them to determine if they have some kind of electrical issue happening so when I got ours I tested it out I had something running in the microwave you move it over there the lights flash up to red or you put it beside your cell phone, the light flashes to red, it's picking up on all that stuff. But if you're just in the middle of the room with no electronics around you, it doesn't do anything. It just has one green light. So when we're in the schoolhouse, we had that in the room. You know, we think we're connected to someone by the SS method. I pick that up, I start moving around, suddenly I find a hotspot and it's it's just on top of a desk. There's no electronics on there. It's an old wooden desk. There's nothing underneath the desk. And it's just, it keeps going red and kind of like, responding to our questions with the lights also going off and then I move it at one point because it stops doing activity there and then I find the spot again but this time it's in the middle of the room and so like I basically kind of followed it around the room and it was it was so weird so there was then in that instance there was more quote evidence happening in alignment with the other one so that was really exciting I got to say, I'm pretty impressed. This is not only fun to listen to, but like, I'm actually glad you said how much they cost because it's the correct term, paranormal tourism. It's not like going to prove or disprove anything, but it's tourism. It's interesting. I'm into it because I think it, like I said, like that word faith is funny to me, but for me, just personally, it would be very hard to live in a world where I didn't believe there was like communication and more to it than just like you know, picking up a newspaper and talking to people in like your normal voice and stuff. So I do have to, we're running out of time, but I want to give you one last like little bit of time to talk. Um, How would you explain the link between your interest in paranormal activity, the experience with your father and your overall philosophy with just kind of like morality? That's the last thing I want to wrap up is like, do you feel like there's an actual rule or like system to morality with the way we should behave on earth? I don't. I was thinking about this earlier because I know you asked a lot of your people that, and I think my morality has been mostly informed by being an 80s kids and wholesome cartoons of our generation. Um, But I I don't think my actions are going to affect what happens in the afterlife. Um, I don't believe in like a heaven and a hell. Aside from, I think there is a form of hell in what our brains do to us after death. So if you die traumatically maybe those are the souls that stick around and are maybe trapped in a loop of what happens that happened with their death or um sadness related to that or there's other people that um, maybe they committed acts that have just weighed down on them all their lives and so their brain is just stuck in this jumble of trying to you know figure that out i also i love watching the show kindred spirits i saw this one episode where they were supposedly speaking to a ghost who's kind of angry and the more they kind of broke things down it seemed as though he said I don't really want to move on because he did believe in a hell and he was worried what might be on the other side of him because he didn't feel like he lived a good life so there's a theory that sometimes souls stick around to uh, work through almost like penitence for what they did in life before they feel ready to then move on just like prisons are very actively haunted a lot of people say because those are people that are also still paying penitence after life. So I feel like that's a form of hell. Um, But in general, I don't murder because I wouldn't want to take a life. I don't uh, rob someone because I don't want to cause pain. I just 
my morality is based on just what makes me feel good and bad in my life now. And if I do a bad thing, I was always the kid that if I got in trouble, I would just burst into tears as a child and go, I'm so sorry. You know, it's just, I don't, I lie. I'm not a perfect person. I I definitely have my faults, but um, I feel them immensely when I do them. So that's my morality. It doesn't really have anything to do with the afterlife. Well, actually, it totally did. And I thought you tied everything together with that incredible answer. So Megan, Janik, thank you so much for helping us put another nail in the coffin. I really appreciate your take on everything. And I'm going to take home with me this idea that you can believe in spirituality and you can be a spiritual person, but it doesn't mean that you have to believe in some sort of like corny sense of morality. Thank you, Mike. This is a lot of fun. Once again, everyone, I am Mike Oppenheim and you have been listening to Coffin Talk, exit interviews with the living. And we will see you soon. When I walk in the